The first scripture reading in unison is taken from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. The word of the Lord. I'd like to invite the kids forward. We'll meet at the front pew for the children's sermon. Good morning. Indiana and Alexis and Scarlett and Violet and Sam. Good morning. And everybody has their bags. And a kitty cat. All right. So thinking about darkness, have you what's a fun game that you've played in the dark? Manhunt, yeah. at night, yeah, it it's like hide and seek. In the, dark, it's at night in the dark with flashlights. Oh, how cool is that, Sam? What's the game? A go- a game called Ghost. How do you play it? Okay, all right, that's okay. Another time we'll fi- we'll figure that out. Any other? Shadow puppets? Oh, that's fun. So that is some light, but you know it's all in the dark, but then you have like a... That's neat. That's a fun thing. I didn't think of that one. When I was a kid, we used to have this one family that would come over, and we would play hide-and-seek in the dark, but um, in the house we would put like blankets or something in the windows, and we would turn off the light in this... And just in a bedroom, right? And it would be completely dark, right? So you could like... And then, you know, the person who was it, who had to find everybody, would just, you know, sit there, and everybody would go to their spaces. And you could, like, stand in the middle of the room, right, and just, and they, and they wouldn't see you. Have you um, ever done anything like that? No? Okay. So I'm going to tell you, I have, I remember this really well, is, like, suddenly when everything's really, really dark and you're trying to be really, really quiet, suddenly, like, the sound of your breath is really loud, Right? Um, and, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, they're going to find me because I'd be nervous. And, and you're like, oh, shoot, shoot, don't breathe so loudly. And then you're trying to bre- not breathe so loudly. And, it was, and, you know, and it, was, it was a lot of fun, that game. We had a lot of fun with that. I want you to close your eyes for a second. Wow, it got really quiet. When you close your eyes, suddenly... You rely on what? Your ears, right? You can open your eyes. <laughs> you can, um, and suddenly you rely on your other senses. We just read a story about a guy who was being really, really mean to the, to the followers of Jesus. 
he did not like them at all, and he wanted them all to be in jail. He wanted them all, he wanted to lock them up in prisons because he thought they were completely wrong, right? Now, he was very, very sure of himself. He was absolutely convinced that he was right and they were wrong. And suddenly, he loses his sight, and he has a vision, which is something that, you know, it's not not like something that you can that like you can touch he has this vision of Jesus saying to him <laughs> basically saw you got it wrong why are you why are you persecuting why are you hurting the people who are following me and then he's like blind for 3 days and he has to rely on other people sometimes we can say when somebody's like so sure of themselves about something and you know that they're wrong we can say they're just blind to the truth Right? They're not really blind, but they're blind to the truth. Right? And, but for, for this guy, Saul, who he's renamed Paul, he, he had to have this experience in order for him to recognize that he was wrong. Isn't that crazy? That he needed that much convincing? And, but then, but then once, he, once he realized that he was wrong, he changed his ways. Right? One of the... Uh, God is so good that way. And we actually, there's a, there's a song that we're going to sing later in the service where we say, I was, I was blind, but now I see. And it wasn't literally blind. It was, I didn't see the truth, but now I see it. Right? Sometimes, you know, we pray for folks that they might find the truth when they're really wrong. And sometimes for ourselves, I think we need to be mindful that sometimes we can, we can get things wrong. And so we pray that for God to to put us on the right path, to be able to see and hear and understand what is true. Shall we fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads, and we're going to pray. God, we pray for eyes that see, ears that hear, minds that understand, hearts that believe, that you are, that following you is the way that leads to peace, joy, hope, and love. And we pray for our loved ones as well. Lord, help us not to be, to be blind to your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Continuing our story in Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 19. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come, to him, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There were two battleships on maneuvers at sea. The weather was bad. So at nightfall, the captain of one remained on the bridge to keep watch through the patchy fog. Shortly after dark, the lookout on the wing of the bridge reported, light bearing on the starboard bow. 
Is it steady or is it moving astern? Called the captain. Steady, captain, said the lookout, which meant that the other boat was on a dangerous collision course with the captain's ship. The captain uh, called out to the signal man, signal that ship. We are on a collision course. Advise you change course 20 degrees. A signal came back. Advisable for you to change course 20 degrees. The captain said, send. I'm a captain. Change course 20 degrees. I am a second class seaman, sir, came the reply. You had better change course 20 degrees. By the time the captain, by that time the captain was furious. He spat out, send, I'm a battleship. You change your course 20 degrees. Back came the flashing light. I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> and the captain muttered, change course 20 degrees. Saul's own experience has been like that of the captain of the battleship, thinking that he's in charge, that, he's, that he knows it all. He discovers that he isn't and that he doesn't. Then he goes out to spend the rest of his life speaking to others, saying, there is a lighthouse. It is Jesus Christ. I advise you change course. That was written by Anthony Robinson and Robert Wall. There's a sermon right there. So let's talk about Ananias. There's much written about Paul and his most famous conversion story, but this is Ananias' only, Ananias's only claim to fame. Ananias from Damascus, who had a vision to go find the persecutor of the Jesus followers and lay hands on him and pray <laughs> with understandable hesitation. But he did as he was asked and welcomed Paul to the family. He called him Brother Paul. And then he disappears from Scripture. Will Willimon, a Methodist pastor, bishop, in his commentary, is clear to say that we do not know what motivated Saul to persecute the, the Jesus followers, but people ascribe to him all sorts of motives. Was he ambitious? Was he trying to keep the doctrine of the church pure? Did he have violent tendencies that could be sanctioned by the church? None of, none of, none of the above, all of the above? We can't really know. And we can imagine different outcomes for Ananias. Did he tell people or did he keep it quiet? Did he brag? Did he puff himself up? Kept telling the story over and over again so that when people saw him coming, oh no, here he comes with his, hey, did I tell you about the time? Yes, 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 we know the story. Or did they defer to him? Remember, he's the one who went to Paul and helped convert him. Or maybe Ananias' wife bragged on him and he would shush her and say, I just did what we're called to do. Everybody does their part. That last one's my favorite. Who would you rather be, Ananias behind the scenes or Paul up front? The charismatic leader, the exhorter, the movement maker about whom movies are made. Or Ananias, who we only know because of his association with Paul, but without whom the story would have been very different. This is his claim to fame. I don't know if we have a choice. The most influential religious leaders are, are not those who have sought the spotlight, but it was kind of thrust on them. Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, even Martin Luther, the, you know, the founder of the Reformation, he, he was seeking to reform the church. He didn't want to start a whole denomination. Bertolt Brecht, in his play Galileo, says, unhappy the land where heroes are needed, which is to say where everybody's waiting for somebody else to do something. Unhappy the land where everybody is waiting. We all do our part, big and small. In the book that I've been reading about leading change on purpose, it, it talked about leadership and not it, public speaking isn't as important as public listening, really listening to people, to know what to do, 
if we're listening to God's call, we do what we do because we're called to do it. But be wary of the faithless friend called ego. I have a friend from seminary who has become a national name uh, on social media. She pops up in my feed every once in a while, uh, speaking out to some issue. And I think she's exactly where she wants to be, and I pray for her, because very often folks on, who, who get that national name can have very hard falls. Which reminds me of another pastor, preacher in New York City years ago. I'd seen him speak. He was invited to come, you know, give pointer to other pastors because he'd been so successful with his own church. And scandal brought him down. Plagiarism and infidelity. A friend of mine has a theory about him was that he that he knew it was he knew he was a fraud, or he thought he was a fraud. He felt himself a hypocrite, so he undid himself. And He's found his footing again, helping others in ministry. And my guess is his first word of advice, don't believe your own press. I think of the people in my life who have been like Ananias, who made a difference. It was something small, but it meant a lot. The right word at the right time, or that consistent showing up to do the, to do the little things that make a big difference the people who made church feel like home for me when I was a kid, who loved me and encouraged me, who learned my name, who asked me about myself, who modeled their faith through service. Small things, bringing flowers to the nursing home or singing in the choir, painting Sunday school classrooms, doing chores for older folks who couldn't do it for themselves. As I say those things out loud, I'm wondering whether you are thinking of people as well. Who were the people, who were the people who in their small way made you feel welcome? Who put themselves out there for you to make you feel loved? Who were there just at the right time? Who ushered you into the family of God? I have a list of people. But I want you to think of someone, a name, someone that you want to honor. And I want us to do this together. So I'm going to say, Lord, we are thankful for, and then I'm going to invite you to say that name of that person. And I know I could could stand up here for five minutes and list names of all the second moms and dads that I had as a kid at church. But we're going to do this together. Do you have that name? Can I see a thumbs up? All right. So I'm going to say, Lord, we are thankful for, and then we're all going to say those names together. Lord, we are thankful for Mr. and Mrs. Hillman. Do you want one more time to do that? I'm going to pick a different name. All right. Ready? Lord, we are thankful for Mr. and Mrs. Carson. And we could just keep doing this, right? Uh, uh, the folks in our lives, the small things that made a difference. If those folks are still around for you, please let them know that you said their name out loud in worship this morning. Or, blow them a kiss. I would rather be an Ananias than a Paul, but we don't always get to choose. God chooses for you. What we get to choose is to be grounded. Grounded in faith and faithfulness, willing to serve when called upon. Back to Saul, who becomes Paul. Saul is a Hebrew name, and he's given a Latin name. He's a Jew who is then sent out to be the missionary to the, to the Gentiles. He would be the bridge between the 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 Jewish community, and the Gentiles. Paul is from the Roman family named Paulus, which means small or humble. Don't you love how God renamed him? <laughs> kind of like, this is, this is your work, man. And Ananias means God is merciful. The mercies of the Lord are from everlasting to everlasting. 
May it be so through the small acts of love and service carried out in the name of Jesus by you, brothers and sisters, by all of us. The small things make a huge difference when they are done in love and in Jesus' name. Amen.